Welcome to Limitless, the blind beginnings podcast where seeing things differently inspires limitless possibilities. This podcast is being brought to you by Blind Beginnings, an organization based in Vancouver, Canada, that supports children and youth who are blind or partially sighted, along with their families. Limitless was created in order to inform, educate, entertain, and share stories from within the blind and partially sighted community, in order to show the world that the opportunities for those who are blind or partially sighted are truly limitless. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to your host, the executive director and founder of Blind Beginnings, Sean Marcelet. Welcome back to Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast. I'm your host, Sean Marcelet. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. We have an exciting episode. We were doing a program last year called Exploring Work, where we were interviewing individuals who were blind or partially sighted about their jobs. And we decided to turn this into one of our one of the features of our podcast, but we're going to do it in a kind of more interesting way. So my co-host today has an interest in the career of the guest that we're going to interview. We're going to be talking about occupational therapy. So I'd love to introduce my co-host back, Ishita. Welcome back to the podcast. Hello. Hello. Do you want to maybe introduce yourself, uh, your level of vision, and where you're at in your uh, pursuit of this career? Sure. So um, I have a condition called cone rod dystrophy, which primarily just affects my central field of vision. So I can see uh, larger shapes and colors fairly well, but I have issues with seeing fine details. Um, and I actually, it was kind of hard for me to figure out what I wanted to do when I was going into university. Um, I'm currently a third year student, but when I was entering, I was very confused. I knew I wanted to go into psychology as my major, but no idea what I wanted to do with it. So um, after, I think in my second year, when I had a more personal experience with an occupational therapist through a relative who needed a, an OT services, um, I really loved the work that they did. And I found it amazing just how much of an impact they could have. So I decided to look into it and see uh, what kind of career it could lead to, because I, I I actually hadn't heard of OT and a lot of people that I talk to um, don't know what I'm talking about when I mention OT, I have to explain it. So I approached uh, Sean to see if I could meet someone who uh, she knew who was an OT with the visual impairment. And uh, here we are. Yes. All right. So I'm excited to introduce our guest, Shauna. Um, I've known Shauna for oh quite a few years. We used to play goalball together. And uh, so she's a fellow athlete and also an occupational therapist. Welcome, Shauna. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Um, yeah, I'm so excited that you're here. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about your vision? Sure, sure. Um, so I've had my level of vision that I have now, I've had since birth. I was born with cataracts, as were both of my sisters. And way, way, way back when I was born, <laughs> uh, there was not great surgery for cataracts, not the, um, you know, the surgeries we have these days that, you know, most of our grandparents get and are pretty much granted full vision afterwards. I had a series of surgeries as a baby and a very young toddler that allowed me to have partial vision. So I, um, I do have, I do read and, and I do, um, you know, do manage, I get around independently. I do do some cautious cycling on my own. Um, you know, so I do have partial vision for sure. That does, you know, aid me through my day. Um, and as of right now, my vision is pretty stable, although I've recently developed glaucoma, but I'm on drops for that, uh, which seems to be um, managing things quite well. Awesome. Okay, so I'm just going to let Ishita just hit you with some questions, if that's okay. Absolutely. And, you know, no holes barred and there's no, there are no bad questions. So please ask anything that's on your mind. It's no problem. All right, okay. let's do it. <laughs> Thank you. I have a lot of questions. Great. Um, 
<laughs> but I think I would want to start off with um, asking you if you could provide some context as to what your job is, because like I said, I know a lot of people who don't know about OT or haven't even heard of what it is. So maybe just give a little bit of insight as to what the job is and what sort of your daily tasks are within the job. Sure. Well, and you know, that is actually, it's sort of an ongoing joke among occupational therapists that um, what exactly, or, or having to constantly describe what occupational therapy is. Uh, you know, it's not overtime. OT doesn't stand for overtime. It doesn't stand for Old Testament. You know, it doesn't stand, <laughs> you know, the, the list goes on and on. Um, but I, one of the reasons, though, I think there is sometimes confusion about what occupational therapy is, is because it is quite, the task can be quite varied and it is quite nuanced. So I think that's part of the reason. But I think the gist is, is that we're trying to enable our clients, the people we work with, to gain function in areas of their life that are meaningful to them. So this could be, you know, fall, you know, because somebody has a disability, this could be following an injury, following a surgery, following an illness, um, you know, collaborating with them and then enabling them the opportunities, the tools, the strategies to do the things in their day that are meaningful to them. So not imposing ideas about what I think they should do, but actually collaborating and figuring out, you know, what do you want to do and what are the obstacles to getting there? How can we help you get there safely? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, when when I was actually looking into OT, I, I remember some I, I watched like a, a lecture giving a lecture about OT at uh, UBC and it was um, doctors, gen uh, nurses, like the traditional medical staff that you hear of provide diagnosis and medication, but OTs and PTs provide um, standard of living and getting you back on your feet. And I thought that was a very powerful um, message that I kind of made me go into it. That's what really attracted me to the to the career in the first place. Yeah, um, and that's an interesting way to look at it because I mean, often even in a yeah, it's joked even in acute care when you know it's like PTOT, PTOT. So we do have a lot of uh, overlap, and often when you're working as an occupational therapist in a lot of settings, you know your colleagues, your counterparts are the physiotherapists. Um, which is wonderful. And often when I'm meeting my clients for the first time, uh, a new client, and I'll say, you know what, if you're a little bit confused about our varied roles, think about it like this. Physio is going to help you get going with the, the bare bones you need for flexibility, strength, and mobility. And then we're going to help you use that strength and mobility for function. The things you want to complete in your day-to-day -day life when you think about a typical day and the things you want to be able to complete before, you know, you leave this program or this facility, that's what we want to help you get to. Okay. What made you go into this career in the first place? Um, I was very lucky to be, uh, from a very young age, somehow my mother uh, involved us in Camp Easter Seal. And that's, I'm not sure if, is there Camp Easter Seal? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So it's, you know, uh, in our, I think our, we have quite an elaborate Camp Easter Seal here in Saskatchewan. It's built on a really beautiful um, sort of outdoor area with lots of ramps and beautiful trees. It's, it's lovely. Anyways, I went there from a, for, as a camper from the age of six until I was 14. I initially, I was with a lot of campers with physical disabilities. So it was very quickly normalized to me. Um, and then the older I got, I began to be involved or put in uh, other camps that were for kids with diabetes, kids who had cystic fibrosis, kids who had visual impairments, hearing impairments. So it was all very quickly normalized for me. Um, but then after I finished going as a camper, I returned as a staff member and then as a senior staff member. So, you know, I really became exposed to people being engaged in activities that somehow they thought were beyond their limits. And I think that really inspired me, you know, people with extremely high spinal cord injuries, getting them on a horse, getting them in a canoe, you know, things that just, I think were really inspiring to them. 
you know, help them uh, test their boundaries and enjoy life. And, you know, just, you know, just feel relaxed in a, uh, in a setting that maybe they never thought they could have that uh, experience in. So I think that was definitely an inspiration for wanting to go into OT. That's amazing. Yeah, I think, like you said, the the thing with OT and that draws me to it is that there's no like standard, like you can work with so many different kinds of people, um, people with disabilities, people with injuries, seniors, um, any any sort of uh, type of people. And also there's, I feel like no one day is the same, I've heard. <laughs> um, Absolutely. And, yeah, and there's like so much going on and it's like a, a career that you can never get bored in, uh, I, I feel like. So it's definitely a wonderful thing that I'm looking forward to if I could, if I do pursue it. But um, so now we're going to get into the nitty gritty because uh, uh, I am curious as to what the education and experience is required for this career. Sure. Well, you know, I, I believe, like, I can't even believe I'm saying this, but like, as of this year, I've been an occupational therapist for 21 years, which just knocks my socks off, because uh, I still feel like I'm about 21. Anyways, uh, but the career, the qualifications have shifted. So when I first became an occupational therapist, actually, I smiled uh, when you said you had gone into psychology, because I also went into psychology. And then, um, and then I discovered, I met a friend who is an OT and started to realize some of the options in that regard. Uh, but when I applied, it was actually a, a three-year, I mean, it was actually a, like a degree. And now all of that has shifted and now it's a master's program. So you complete an undergrad with the appropriate prerequisites in place, and then you apply to the master's programs. Um, and the two closest to me were Manitoba and Alberta, Edmonton and Winnipeg. And I got, I, I didn't get into Alberta and I got into the program in Winnipeg. So that's where I went. So it was a three-year program. Uh, when I went and, um, you know, there obviously were the fieldwork placements, um, which allow you to experience different areas of occupational therapy. And at that time also, uh, there was no, it was, you know, solely based on academics. So there wasn't an interview for the U of M. And I think there is now, which I think mm -hmm. is a really good thing. Yeah, uh, I think um at least from what I've been researching, uh, and I think it may vary from province to province, but here in BC, um, the only ones that I know of that exist are UBC and UVic with OT programs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and their requirements are quite extensive. <laughs> it's There's the educational part of having a high GPA of around, I believe, uh, B plus or average, a B plus average or higher. Um, and then the the experiences also include um, having 70 hours of work, uh, work or volunteer experience in generally disability settings. So people working people with disabilities, that's kind of what they recommend on their on their website. But I believe it can also be extended to people with senior seniors, senior citizens or um, anywhere where you can get some sort of, um, I guess, volunteer experience relating to uh, vulnerable populations. I think that's such a great development because it's not only going to help you through an interview process, it's going to help you uh, potentially get a sense of what populations you enjoy. Plus, it sort of just gets you comfortable talking to people, being around a wide variety of people, which I think long term is just going to help people in their careers as OTs. For sure. Yeah. That kind of leads me to my next question about the interview process, because a lot of schools that I have uh, researched do have that um, interview process. Once you've been accepted, go to the interview and only then if you pass, you get accepted. So um, did you go through that? And what was that like for you? No, there was no interview process at the U of M when I applied. Oh, okay. uh, and I think that would have been a great thing. And as you can probably tell, I have absolutely no talking. So, I mean, no difficulty, you know, um, speaking openly. So truthfully, I think I would have rocked that interview. But, <laughs> but fortunately, my academics uh, allowed me to, 
to get in, which was uh, which was good. Um, I think that the academic standard has increased since I got in. So would I get in today? I don't know, but um, but yeah. So I didn't have an interview. I know some programs did at the time when I first entered the profession, but yeah, I didn't have to do one. Okay, very interesting. Um, as as an experienced OT, would you have any advice for going through an interview relating to this career, just in in general that you've noticed? Uh, sure. Well, I think you know you're kind of already doing it. You know, you're talking to OTs, you're researching occupational therapy. Um, again, I think it's it is such an asset to be able to take into an interview that you're you're. Uh, you have you have had exposure to a wide variety of people and have enjoyed learning uh, learning about other people's stories, uh, learning about their disabilities, their abilities, their challenges, and being able to empathetically reflect on them, and then you know provide your own reflections and um, see what you've learned about um, about others and about how to be compassionate and you know, how to, um, you know, help people want to reach their goals. And it, so it sounds like you're on your way. I'm just uh, curious, Shauna, since there wasn't an interview for your program, once they, once you were in the program and they realized you had a disability, or maybe was there an opportunity to disclose in your application, were there any concerns about that? You know, I've never thought about that until you just brought it up. You know, aha, uh -huh, that's interesting. And you know what, speaking with people, I mean, I think that dis, uh, disabled student services have evolved a lot in the last 20 years as well. Like, uh, I mean, I remember doing absolutely ridiculous things all the way through, you know, through high school for sure. And sometimes in university where I didn't fully disclose that I had difficulty, let's say, you know, um, seeing what was being presented. Uh, <laughs> Oh uh, gosh, we didn't have PowerPoint. There were like projectors <laughs> and yeah. and chalkboards. And I just pretended I could see it all. I mean, it's so ridiculous in retrospect. I mean, imagine I often have reflected on how well I could have done in school if I actually would have known what was on the board in front of me. I mean, I, I do not advocate for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I, I agree. Just think now of being able to get, you know, whether it be audio or, or you know, um, advanced, uh, you know, exposure to what was going to be presented. Like it, I don't know if you experienced that too, Sean. Like right now, I feel like there's so many great opportunities for people to not have to, you know, squint at chalkboards and oh my gosh, like yeah, I really yeah, like it's a different so world. Yes, yeah, so many great opportunities to learn and get the information without having to struggle to get it. And I think I was still part of that generation where you really had to fight to um, to get timely access to to notes and to lecture material. So I just think what a great advantage moving forward here mm -hmm. is just to be able to really dig into you know what you can learn about OT. Um, yeah, and, and just and, and to be able to dive into a program and be able to tell people, you know what, I've got great initiative, I've got great strengths, and, you know, I'm going to use them to uh, go. Sorry, I've lost sight of, I'm just getting excited here. I lost sight <laughs> of Can you restate your question? Because I, I got off topic there. I apologize. No, I that's okay. It's all good. <laughs> it, it was more, did anybody have concerns that, about your visual impairment once you were in the program? You know what, if they did, which, you know, I bet people had questions. Again, I think it was just sort of speaks to the history. Nobody really expressed them to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so, no, I don't think people were, I mean, they might have had concerns, uh, but they didn't, they didn't come to me with it. I remember asking for extra time to do certain things. Um, we have a gross anatomy lab where you have to go and take a look at cadavers and take a look at muscles and take a look at tendons and vessels. And I remember asking for extra time to do that and for extra assistance to, to find certain things and to make sure I was understanding what was happening, you know, having the tactile experience as well as the visual experience to really enhance my learning, to learn about the body and to learn about the body systems. 
Um, I remember asking for some extra time for exams, which I was allocated, but, you know, it was kind of um, a big deal then where I think right now making accommodations for different exams and, and that sort of thing is much more commonplace and just wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I remember um, asking for a little extra time on student placements to, you know, to read charts. I needed just a bit more time to take in all the visual information. And, um, but I have to say, um, you know, it, it went quite smoothly. The, the biggest barrier actually to me learning or having certain accommodations, I think was often me, you know, rather than holding my head high and simply expressing what I needed, um, I think I was a little too sheepish, um, which is somewhat ironic because the whole goal of occupational therapy is about helping people learning learn to function, you know, in their environment to the best of their ability. So um, I certainly don't do that kind of thing anymore. Hold my head pretty high and let people know what I need. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's one thing I've been thinking a lot about, and that that's wonderful advice truly um but like when when you're dealing with um a lot of different kinds of patients or or clients or any anything of that sort um kind of how the disclosure process works or would they maybe have some preconceived notions about you it's like one hand if i'm working with persons with disabilities they may think that oh i have lived experience and it may make them feel more comfortable, but if it's someone, if it's not in like the disability realm and they may think it's, I don't know, may have some sort of negative connotation to it. So have you been in situations like that? And, and like, how have you sort of gone through those? Well, you know what? And I think the people who have preconceived notions about me are probably not the people who actually tell me. So, you know, I try to just, um, you know, I, I, and the people who do ask, I let them know that I'm I'm glad that they're asking. You know, oh, thanks so much for that question. I'd be happy to tell you more about my vision. And the people that I work closely with, I find it very helpful to tell them also how they can help or assist me as well. You know, and sometimes when I've had students, because I've had a wide variety of OT students over the years as well, who have who have mostly all had great vision. I just say, you know what, if you see me missing something, let's work as a team here. So we'll go in together. If you think I'm missing something, a reaction from a client or or something like that, you please feel free to let me know where we can go in here and work as a team. Um, I had the great experience about two years ago of actually having a student uh, from the U of M with a visual impairment. And uh, I was sought out particularly to sort of guide this to guide this student through this experience. She just did an awesome job. And what I really valued about her is that at no point did she, was she, she bashful about her, her sight impairment. She very clearly explained it to people. She looked unabashedly looked closer at things when she needed to. Um, and, 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 the, cause there, and there was so much more to her. She was delightfully articulate. She could ask great questions. You know, she could put her own concerns aside to really connect with clients. And uh, she just did a fabulous job. That's amazing. I'm so happy to hear that, that you had that experience. I Um, did. I was very excited to to have that experience. That's awesome. I've been, uh, I reached out to a friend's friend who's in the program I'm planning to go into. And she mentioned that um in her program uh of ot at ubc that there is a uh professor with a disability i didn't i'm not i don't remember which kind but um and that they're actually really encouraging persons with disabilities to go into academia and make things very accessible and they're trying to encourage that so that made me feel a lot better too well and and like you said sometimes i think it's an asset there's this concept called you know therapeutic use of self and I think sometimes it's very easy for, for medical professionals to sort of, mm, you know, I'm here to help you. I'm here to uh, expose you to my wealth of knowledge and I will fix you. Whereas when you've lived, you've lived some, you have some learned experience that, you know, allows a client to know that uh, I've faced some challenges 
These are the challenges I've had. This is how I approach them. I'm not saying I have the same experience as you, but I just want you to know I'm entering this relationship with a, in a, with a, you know, with empathy. Um, barriers are tough. Um, and, uh, you know, I really want to collaborate with you and, you know, and I've had, I've had clients who have had recent vision loss as well due to, um, due to stroke, due to tumor, tumors. And, you know, I've been able to say, you know, give them examples of, of, you know, how I've persevered with certain tasks. I remember this one gal, she was very curious. She had lost a great deal of vision following a tumor resection. And she said, Shauna, I'm never going to be able to wear mascara again, which seems like, okay, so big deal. You can't wear mascara, but it was a big deal to her. And so, you know, we came up with, we came up with ways for her to apply her mascara. And that was important to her. And that was really, you know, and she's, you know, she wants to know how I did it with decreased vision. And, um, and so, you know, there's little things like that. It's just really, really special in a way that I can share a part of myself. Uh, okay, so I'm not sure if you, if this is newly introduced or if this has been there for a while, but um, the OTR exam, um, if you wrote it, what was your experience writing that? Do you mean the national exam? Uh, yeah, I think that's that's the one that I found that said the OTs in Canada do have to, to pass oh. to... Oh gosh, yeah, that was a real slog. It was a six hour exam when I took it. And mm -hmm. there was three hours in the morning, a lunch break, and then three hours in the afternoon. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> so I, much for I, the encouragement, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> encouragement is over. No, no. Um, what I mean by awful is awful in terms of length. And because most of it was multiple, well, I think all of it was multiple choice. So it's always, you know, pick the best answer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but gosh, you make it through and, and then, and then you're done. And okay. I, you know, and yeah, I just think it's long, it's tedious, but it's totally doable. I don't know what the format is now and it's likely changed. I know they have uh, committees that are constantly reviewing the content and trying to make the fairest, best exam possible. Um, so yeah, obviously I, I did pass it and, uh, and it's done and then you never have to do it again. So that's also excellent. And so, yeah, I think it's manageable. It's, it's, it's the basics. It's the core of OT. Did you get extra time or was that six hours? That's what everyone got. You know what? I don't think I did take, I think I took the full amount of time put it that way. And not everybody did. I certainly took the full three hours in the morning and the three hours in the afternoon from what I remember. Um, and I think that I, I now again, it's so long ago, 20, 20 years ago, but I think I, I think I was offered extra time if I needed it. And I certainly thinking now, I, I sure hope I did because I should have, because yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of reading. That's a lot of eye fatigue. Okay. Yeah. I'm not incredibly discouraged because I've written eight hour exams in university. Oh, uh, no, <laughs> And I, I'm grateful to hear that it's not something you have to redo every few years. That's one thing I was worried about, but. Um, not only, only the only time you have to redo those sorts of things is if you're moving to another regulatory body. So if I was moving to the United States and I wanted to be certified as a, as a therapist in another country, you'd probably have to write their regulatory exam. Okay. But for, for in provincial jurisdictions, you have to register also, like for myself, I have to register annually with the Saskatchewan Society of Occupational Therapists, but there's no exam. There are competencies that we now have to do related to um, education and learning that we have to do every year, but you just have to describe your the learning you hope to, you have to have learning goals every year, but it's not an exam and you're not tested on it. It's just to enhance and keep up our, our learning and education. Uh, another question I kind of had related to that was, I talked to someone who, who did OT um, quite a few years ago, and back then when you Study, when you did your program in a specific province, you could uh, practice anywhere. I've heard now that that's changed. That if you practice in a certain province, you can only, sorry, if you do you study in that one province, you have to practice there. Um, I don't know if that's true, but I wanted oh, to ask if you had any knowledge on that. I do not think that is true. 
Um, again, I think that, I mean, we've had play, people, students doing placements, for example, from out of province. We've also, I mean, I think that the only thing is wherever you end up working, you have to be registered with that provincial organization. Okay. Yeah. What, what do you enjoy most uh, about your job and kind of conversely, what are the biggest challenges in this job? Mm, well, I mean, just to take it broad briefly and then, and then specific. So broadly, I think the joy of having a career in occupational therapy, and I think you've already alluded to this, is that there's so much variety. So within my career, I've worked in acute psychiatry. So I led all the psychoeducational groups uh, for our acute psychiatry ward. I also did one-on-one -on -one goal setting with people, which is kind of like a um, uh, counseling from an occupational therapy perspective. Um, then I also worked in orthopedics. Um, then I worked in an acute care hospital um, for about eight years. And I worked with clients mostly on a surgical ward. I worked in the emergency room. I worked in palliative care and on the medicine wards within that hospital. Uh, I worked in the geriatric service at one of our hospitals here for about 10 years. And two years ago, I moved into rehabilitation. So that's mostly clients with neurological difficulties. And um, that has been, like I said, I've worked for <laughs> 20 years and the last couple of years, just because there's so much to learn working in neuro. Gosh, I feel like a new grad all over again. <laughs> there's so much great learning. And working in rehab, so these are people who have had, uh, recently had strokes, spinal cord injuries, MS, brain injury. You just never know what you're gonna be faced with in a day. And most recently now we're starting to um, have more and more uh, clients with a uh, post-COVID coming to our ward following you know, extensive stay in hospital. So there's always new learning. And that is so wonderful. I think you're absolutely right. I cannot imagine a day of being bored in my job. And the most rewarding, by far, the most rewarding part about direct patient client care for me is, is really connecting with people. I mean, I have the honor on a daily basis of working with clients who, and clients and their families who are facing the greatest challenges of their lives. Um, their lives have been turned upside down, often quite traumatically. And to be able to play a role in them gaining confidence and um, gaining ability, gaining function, honestly, I can say with my heartfelt answer is that being a part of their day and playing an, even a very small role in them regaining, um, you know, a sense of self-worth and, and regaining function in their lives is really, truly very, very rewarding. Any, any major challenges that you faced um, just pursuing this career or like in the day-to-day? Yeah, well, and you know, uh, a small concern, I mean, uh, when I came to rehab, I mean, there's just so much to see and people with such con complex conditions. I honestly have to, I was going to just mention um, my visual impairment, uh, really most of the time, once you get comfortable with your team, and once you get comfortable, more comfortable in your role, really becomes somewhat of a non-issue. Um, as you get to know people, again, people ask questions. They are like, oh, I really noticed you looking closely at that computer screen, or I really notice you leaning forward. And, and, and sometimes clients with, you know, sometimes no fault of their own with, with dementia or, or brain injury, sometimes can say quite disinhibited things to me, which truthfully is actually part of the assessment which is <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, suddenly, you know, you're wondering if they have, let's say uh, uh, disinhibition related to a frontal lobe tumor. Well, when they're presented with my vision and, and the way that I go about things, and even the way my eyes look, <laughs> I very quickly learn whether they're socially disinhibited. So it's like <laughs> part of the assessment. Um, but uh, yeah, some of the other challenges are 
that, you know, we often are working with people who are really struggling and are really suffering. And I think particularly during COVID when people have been often not with their families very much or sometimes not at all. Um, I think compassion fatigue is certainly a real thing. Burnout is certainly a real thing. Um, and sometimes clients pass away. Sometimes clients die. And I had a client who I recently worked for months with getting him um, an advanced seating system so that he could be comfortable trying to work on ways for him to, um, to eat by himself and to do the basics of his self-care for himself. And he actually just passed away two weeks ago and it was extremely sad. And, uh, and, you know, cause OTs are involved with people working in very, um, you know, working in very intimate settings. You know, we go into clients' rooms and in the morning and I'm helping people regain their ability to wash themselves, dress themselves, uh, comb their hair, brush their teeth, eat their meals. So I think that obviously you need, you need some distance once you go home because you can't take home all of their pain. You have to have your own personal boundaries but I'm also human. And that's part of the joy of working with them is that you form connections. So it's kind of the best and the toughest part of the job is that sometimes you have to let go um, as they leave the hospital and lead their, you know, go on leading their lives. And then like, like I said, sometimes, sometimes they die. And so these are some of the struggles as well. Thank you. I really do appreciate that. I feel like that's, a common play, like thing within the medical um, field, but it's not something that's talked about very openly. So I really do appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, it must be. I mean, I work as a counselor as well, and and when clients, I mean, when clients with blind beginnings, I get to know where they are because they don't disappear. But you know, clients in private practice come and go, and and they are telling you the most intimate things, and then. And then they're just gone from your life and you, you wonder, but it, it would be similar. I would think like you've helped them recover from something or get to a point where they can be more independent again, like pursue those goals that they have. And then they're just gone. And you don't, it's not like a doctor where you can follow up really, or do you, do you get to follow up? Um, not often. I mean, what is kind of neat is that in the particular program that I'm in now, we, I work on the inpatient rehab board, but then we also have an outpatient component. So some, even though I don't get to follow them into outpatients, sometimes I do get to see them as they're coming for their other appointments. And that is a real thrill, but the majority of the time, no, I'm just like, I wonder about them. And I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, I just hope you're doing okay. And things are going well. And so, yeah, you just, there's that process of, of, of letting go. And, you know, typically we're just so busy moving on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And that's a struggle is that you cannot, you just will never be able to have enough time to do everything that you want to do, whether you're working privately and particularly publicly there's just never enough time to do everything that you want to do. And so having the ability to let go of some of, let go honestly of, of some of the goals and some of the achievements is, is necessary in order to get as much done as possible without um, having too much stress. Yeah. I'm curious about work-life balance. It's something that, that I definitely struggle with. And I'm, I know you're a mom and you're an athlete and, you know, gone away to compete and things like that. How is this career for fitting in those other pieces of life that are so important? Yeah. Well, and again, I think that's where really doing whatever I can to keep some of that uh, burnout and compassion fatigue sort of that day is really, really important. Um, I mean, I'm not actively competing now, but what um, fitness has taught me is, or athleticism has taught me is that that is my refresh. My reboot is being able to stay active. Um, and so finding opportunities to do that, you know, to meditate, to, to laugh, to have quality time with my kids is huge. And I feel like I'm hearing more and more medical programs lately. I listened to a CBC program called White Coat Black Art and they've been 
spending a lot of time, I think, talking about um, the need for medical professionals to, to take care of themselves. And this is what I'm often talking to caregivers about, family members, you know, in order to give the best version of yourself and to help take care of your loved one, you have to take care of yourself. And I would say the same thing, you know, to myself, to my colleagues, um, that it's, it's really, really important to identify the things that help you recharge, that help you stay hopeful, that, you know, uh, and the basics, you know, again, staying active, getting enough rest. I mean, I know these things get a lot of lip service, but boy, they're really, really important. Um, and, and, you know, um, having a community that's helpful. Um, I think one of my, <laughs> one, I'm very, very fortunate to be married to uh, a physical therapist. So we can come home and talk about our day. And we both really uh, can very quickly connect with what the other is saying. And it just so happens, he's also a great father and a great partner. So I've really, really lucked out there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's also very, very helpful for my life balance. Uh, we strategically have chosen where we live. So we live in the center of our city, basically. And so I have independence getting to and from work. I live 25 minutes away by um, walking to my to the hospital I work at. Oh, nice. So I'm very independent. I can get to and from. I mean, on snowy days, I'm getting to work before any of the drivers. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So, I'm, you know, so I've, you know, I've been able to, and plus those walks are great. They're mm -hmm. a great chance to, to, uh, to de-stress, let go of the day, you know, have a meditative, meditatively focused sort of walk. Um, yeah, those things are really, really important. Uh, I'm curious as to how COVID has impacted uh, your career, because I know you mentioned that you are seeing or you've seen some patients with COVID, but mm -hmm. um, kind of just at large, are you taking patients um, through Zoom or online? And how has that changed um, sort of like the uh, intimate relationship you have with them? Has it has it made an impact on that? Absolutely. It's been huge. I mean, I think a lot of therapists who see people as outpatients did a lot of did a lot of virtual therapy, which I think is possible. But because I work in a hospital setting, nothing has changed. I've had not one day of working from home, which I know a lot of people are probably tired of. I sure wish I could do it just a little bit. But no, I have been at work every day of COVID. That hasn't changed. All that's changed is the regulations that allow, like for example, for the first few months of, first several months of COVID, patients were just not allowed any visitors at all. So in that regard, we really played, uh, first of all, it was very stressful to see people so lonely and struggling, you know, through, let's say they've just had a stroke and they're going through the hardest times of their lives. And the only way that they can, you know, they can only see their family virtually. It was very, very hard. And it was, so sometimes clients would discharge well before they were ready to simply because they just needed to be with family. Um, so that was a real challenge for clients and really having to extend ourselves as medical professionals even more so simply because we were the only visitors people would have in a day. And so, you know, that really changed healthcare a lot. Um, and because we didn't have any clients, we're rehab. So the only time people were allowed visitors in the healthcare system was if they're palliative or, you know, at end of life care, which our clients Typically, that's not the case. So, um, so that was really, really hard. Um, we use a great at different times. We've had to basically be gowned, mask, face shield, gloves. You know, depending on the scenario. So, you know, that is it's it's taxing. I mean, you certainly get used to it, but it is taxing. It really is putting up this um, very physical barrier between you and and people who really need you. So um, much harder for the patients, don't get me wrong, but also a, a struggle for clinicians as well. It gets, it just gets tiring. Well, I don't mean that in a, like a, what I mean is it's stressful because each day it was, this is what we're doing now. The regulations are changing or there's just constant change and you never knew what you're going to be faced with at our little morning meeting, you know, what the new challenge was. 
So, I mean, it certainly, it, it in a public health care is already quite stressful because you're trying to do as much as you can with few resources, but COVID certainly exacerbated those things. Oh, yeah, I could, I can imagine, I mean, your patients or clients aren't necessarily sick they're recovering, right? It's different. Right. So like they're not in the hospital because they are ill yet you have to come in fully covered up and protect like, yeah, it's sort of like those two worlds colliding in, in this weird way that wouldn't normally happen. Exactly. Because we really encourage our clients to, to, you know, we want to get them dressing in their own clothes. We want to get them starting to do more things for themselves. <clears throat> we want them to, um, you know, come into the dining room and share meals. Mm -hmm. So we've had to have changed that. So clients haven't been able to be in our dining room for the last two years. So everybody's back in the room eating by themselves. So it's a much less social uh, experience for clients because some of the best therapy is connecting with others who are also struggling and inspiring one another. So, I mean, that's starting to happen now in small ways, which is exciting, but unfortunately, um, those are, those are all the direct in, indirect casualties of, of COVID, you know, people not getting quite the full experience of rehab that they could simply because of all the restrictions. Wow. I've already learned so much so far, but, uh, I think my final question is, do you, uh, do you have any advice for someone like me who's planning to go into occupational therapy as a career? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I do. I, I mean, I think of some of the things, some of the, how do I talk to my kids? Could I have made I, I, choices, choices that I could have made that would have been better. I mean, being, you know, being not only upfront with the challenges that you have, but also moving ahead confidently and proudly, um, you know, reminding yourself, uh, of your strengths um, moving into whether it be interviews, exams, um, you know, but again, being upfront about, you know, the things that perhaps could be accommodated or changed, you know, being aware that there are so many areas of OT, some requiring more visual precision than others. Like I, you know, there's certainly areas where I think I had to be a little bit more, um, aware of what was going on visually around me than others. Like for example, my role right now in working in rehab, um, and as opposed to, you know, when I was working and, you know, leading groups in acute psychiatry, you know, the visual demands are different. Um, and, but that doesn't mean they can't be learned, but they, but they certainly are different. I can honestly just say, I really have enjoyed my career. I mean, are there stressors? Sure. Ask my husband, he'll go on and on. <laughs> but I, I really find it to be genuinely, I can say a very, very rewarding career, a rewarding job. And although it is stressful at times, fortunately, you know, it is a, it is a nine to five job generally with great, you know, weekends, holidays, and, you know, and we, and we make enough to live a very comfortable life. Well, I mean, you know, just nothing fancy, <laughs> but very comfortable. So, you know, I've been very, very fortunate. And I would, I would certainly not discourage anyone from exploring OT. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to answer my questions. I know there were a lot, but I think I've genuinely learned so much and um, I'm a lot more confident moving forward into pursuing this career. Thank you, Shauna. It's always great to reconnect with you. I'm really grateful that you were able to be here today to share your wisdom. This is sounds, um, yeah, it sounds like the kind of career I would choose if I had to choose all over again, but. But you know what, Sean, um, like, and that's what is so interesting. I, I feel like you are doing OT. Pretty much you're an honorary occupational therapist because this very well <laughs> could be an OT doing exactly what you're doing. And that's the neat thing. OT can be taken into so many different areas and, you know, but it, it could be anywhere, but I just want to say you're already doing it and doing an amazing, inspiring job. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
You've been listening to Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast. If you have a question, a comment, a future topic request, please send us an email to limitless at blindbeginnings.ca. Please share our podcast with a friend, like, subscribe, leave us a rating and join us next time. This podcast has been brought to you by Blind Beginnings, an organization based in Vancouver, Canada that supports children and youth who are blind or partially sighted along with their families. Music for this podcast is composed by Sean Bishop and Clement Chow. Production and audio editing by Rob Minot. For more information about Blind Beginnings and the work it does to support children and youth who are blind and partially sighted along with their families, visit us on the web at www.blindbeginnings.ca and also remember to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time.